All right, back family, here we are. We have 11 pairs of sneakers, multiple sizes. Let me organize them, and then we'll let you know what we got. All right, family, here are the Isis in white. Size six, size four, size six. Now, uh, the little girls, these run a little bit bigger. And same for the sixes. Here they are now. Right, let's moment of transparency. I bought several pairs of shoes for my daughter and my baby sister. They were too big. And instead of sending them all the way back, I was like, man, let me just give them to the family. Here they are in purple. Four, six, and six. Now for the young boys. These are the Admiral. Colorway, these are the Giza sneaker. I actually don't hold you. I want to pair these. I got the corks. You'll see those next. Size 5, size 6, size 7. They do run a little bit bigger, so be mindful of that. And, of course, I got the corks. You guys already know. Got this in size 5. And these are the... Uh, I think these are called the Duns. I got these in size 9. These are narrow, though. Be mindful. All right? These are little. They're comfortable. Because I got a pair for myself. Comment the size, shoe, and the color you want. Remember, if you don't have an IG or a TikTok, I don't have a way to communicate with you to get the proper details to ship this out to you. Make sure you have that. Enter competition. Who knows? With 11 pairs, you might win one. Get one to one of your kids. They get something different. This is 100% black owned. All right? Company was based out of Detroit. They're currently headquartered in Atlanta right now. I know the brother I've been buying shoes from for years. You can go on my channel, type in N E G A S H, and see tons of shoes. All right. So I'm look forward to sending these shoes out to some lucky winners. Peace and black empowerment. Full details in the description below. Y'all let that Indian woman play in black. Bamboozle y'all if y'all want to. I'm telling you, I might tell you a joke, but I will never tell you a lie. Y'all let that Indian woman playing black bamboozle y'all if y'all want to. Baby, I was already not voting for Kamala. I will, I, when I tell you I will vote for the lizard outside my house before I vote for that lady, I am not an idiot. I don't care nothing about her coming around black people talking black. Talk to me how you talk to your Indian mama and daddy. Don't come talking to me saying foe if you do not talk like that around your Indian mama and daddy. I don't care nothing about that. But let me show y'all what I just heard, baby. The dictatorship y'all think y'all running from. Baby, y'all are running straight into. They've already been dictating over your life. That's the crazy part. For the last four years, they've been dictating over your life. Y'all just too silly to see. Among everybody in the community, and just because you legally possess a gun in the sanctity of your locked home doesn't mean that we're not going to walk into that home and check to see if you're being responsible and safe in the way you conduct your affairs. Come again, say who? Come again, say what? This lady said they don't care nothing about you owning your firearm legally in your locked home. That will not stop them from coming into your home to make sure you're handling your firearm how they want you to. Y'all let this Indian woman play in black. Bamboozle y'all if y'all want to. Y'all are going to learn about trying to make history over and over again and it never benefiting you. <laughs> Y'all gonna learn about giving your power away to folks that will literally never give any of their power to you. You know it's bad when black people have to be so delusional to think that the vice president, the second most powerful person in the United States, is powerless. What are you talking about? And then the first most important person in the United States is dang near incompetent incompetent and he's already always on vacation so her job as the vp for somebody that is incompetent and always on vacation is to run the country which is what she been doing she is playing y'all like a fiddle and you let this indian woman that is pretending to be black 
been Indian all her life, and y'all want me to play delusional to the fact that she was sworn in as the first Indian president. Y'all want me to pin a race on her that she ain't never claimed to be until now because she needs your black power. Baby, y'all will be, I promise you, y'all want to learn. Y'all ain't going to, y'all ain't learn after that black man who was barely black played in y'all face and did for his people, which is the LGBTQ. And now she's planning your face doing for her people, which is illegal immigrants. When it came to black people, she said, that's when the sass come out. The sass come out when she talking to black people. I ain't going to just do anything for black people. She told y'all that. But go watch how Kamala feel about immigrants. You know who's running this country. Go watch her. She has like a million interviews with how she feels about immigrants. That's when the empathy and the sympathy and she can form a sentence and she has a heart. That is where it comes out. So the fact that everybody is around her surprised that the legal immigrants is living better than Americans. I'm not because I pay attention to how people are. She comes in black people's face and plays in black people's face and get y'all twerk contests and makes it convenient for you to off your baby. But she ain't doing that for the illegal immigrants, baby. She want them to come. She want them to come over here and multiply. It's seriously, if anybody is in a position to have babies, it's immigrants. They have housing, they have food, they have cash, they're giving businesses. They're in the best position to come over here and supply and multiply. Wasn't no uh, abortion buses at the border. I'm telling y'all, y'all let this lady play in y'all face if you want to. That's on you. That's on you. Y'all gonna y'all gonna learn y'all lesson about pinning races on people that they don't want to be, don't ever claim to be, will never be, be until it comes time to take your power to get them to the top. They got to come take your power to get them to the top. And then when they get to the top, middle finger to you. And now you're being delusional and y'all making up all type of excuses for these people that never cared about you. We'll never care about you. For the last 60 years, we've been voting for them and got nothing to show for it but pennies and pebbles. I would vote for Kamala Harris. If I was a white supremacist, black Americans make up about 13% of the population, but yet we make up nearly 40% of all abortions in America. In 2023, the US had the highest rate of abortion in more than 10 years. So if I were a white supremacist who wanted to continue the killing of black babies, I would vote for Kamala. Okay, I'ma just say it cause ain't nobody else gonna see it. If we don't start retaliating, they gonna keep killing us. We one of the most powerful races on the fucking planet, and we the most fucking oppressed. And you telling me, man, y'all as, as a race, we need to really get it together. And if you asking me, I'm with all the fuck shit. So when y'all ready, I'm ready. See, that's the shit I'll be talking about, y'all. These the motherfuckers we need to get going. Y'all steady asking me who, who I'm talking about. I'm talking about these motherfuckers. I'm a Democrat, and I didn't know I was supporting a party who wanted to put porn in children books and then call it freedom of speech. But then when you criticize Kamala Harris's policies, it's misinformation. No, I'm with you. I get it. I get it. So I'm responding to you and I'm responding to the sister as well. When y'all say us, are you sure it's us or it's tethers? See, a tether is not somebody who's just an immigrant, but someone who's an immigrant. Typically, somebody cosplaying as FBA, Foundation of Black Americans, also known as freedmen and such other things. They like to come and lurk in the midst and then act like they're us and try to undermine and degrade and berate us and make it seem like we just got this self-hate going on. Because it's not us en masse. It's the motherfuck, the fleers, the tethers. So I just wanted to drop that little nugget. Yeah, it, I highly doubt it's actual black folk. They might be spoof accounts as well. So remember that. A lot of people take a picture and throw it up there and act like they're black. Especially the palm color ones. And most of them are from, drum roll please, African American. Uh, so it's starting to highly doubt it's us on Mac. I remember there's a lot of spoof accounts where it's really palm color people pretending to be black. And there's a lot of non-FBA or non-Foundation Black Americans, those people who are from an immigrant background, uh, with all the self-hate, the fleeing kind, not our riders. We have riders in the Caribbean and Africa. Have We do have a fleeing class that come from over there. They're like the, I'm FBA nigga, and sit there and integrate. And usually going after sisters like yourself, because you're a cute sister. So these cats said, no, they never have a chance with you. 
Oh, I, 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 I have to make her feel bad because she's a pretty black girl. And, you know, no goofy dude. So kind of be mindful of the count, especially ones without any pictures. And even ones pictures, just kind of check them out because they may not be like us. By the way, I think I asked, where'd you get that from? So this gentleman was nice enough to give us a history lesson. Let's see what he's talking about. He says, Lyndon B. Johnson, which was a Democratic president, said that I'll have those black people voting Democrat for the next 200 years. Now this comment was on this video and this talks about fact checking this quote right here from Lyndon B. Johnson, the Democratic president. Now in the defense of this comment right here, no, this quote was not fact checked. We don't know if Lyndon B. Johnson, the Democratic president actually said this, but we can verify that he said a whole bunch of other racist stuff. And this is what he said about the civil rights bill. He said, we're gonna have to let this hard ER bill pass. It's because of this hard ER bill he was saying this quote. Now, again, this quote is not verifiable, but this quote right here is absolutely verifiable. Pause to read this gorgeous quote by this racist man. So y'all wanna fact check something and say that this isn't facts, but it doesn't matter because he said a slew of other stuff that makes this look like nothing. This is the Democrats in the nutshell for y'all. Enjoy. Now, if one of y'all come on here and say that there was a party switch, I might actually snap out. Y'all let the Democrats say that stuff and then tell y'all it was a party switch. Come on now, I think y'all smarter than that. I told y'all, you got women getting into it with their husbands, getting mad at their husbands, leaving their husbands or their man because they don't want to vote for Kamala. I told y'all that this is a prime example right here that these women are only voting for her so they can flex on men that there's a woman president. I'm telling y'all, man, they ain't voting for none else. They don't care that this administration is uh, destroying the economy or none like that. Gas prices, people can't afford our homes, the immigrants, all that stuff. Women don't care about that, dog. They only want to be able to flex on men that it's a woman president if she wins. Mark my word, if she wins, all you're going to hear, especially black women, where yeah, it's a woman president. Da -da -da. I'm telling you. They get mad at their husbands and their men for not voting for this woman because they want to see, they want to be able to live to say, I witness a woman president. Women are not supposed to leave, you know what I'm saying, at all. But y'all trying to go against the order. That's all right. That's all right. Go, go against the order. Go against the grain. But I'm telling y'all, they only want her in there because she's a woman. They don't give a dang that they destroying the economy. And they don't care about the immigrants that's coming in and starting these gangs and raving people homes and taking people's, you know, uh, rent money. They don't care about that. <laughs> if you guys are saying Kamala is our representation of our first black female president, I don't ever want to argue with you niggas about my blackness again. Vice President Kamala Harris just sat down with the National Association of Black Journalists to discuss the economy, black male voters, Israel and Gaza, and gun control. But y'all want to know what she has said about the economy? I grew up a middle class kid. Nah, I'm just fucking with you. We ain't about to go over that bullshit again, that rehearsed bullshit again. What I would like to hone in on is the situation with the black male voters and them divesting from the Democrat Party in favor of Donald Trump. Madam Vice President, black men, as you know, are a closely watched voting bloc. You've hosted black men at your residence. Yep. You have uh, engaged black men and censored them in your uh, econ economic uh, opportunity tour. Mm -hmm. uh, but polling shows that some black men, particularly young black men, uh, are considering voting for Donald Trump and they see him as better for the economy. What is your message to young black male voters who feel left out of this economy and how can your economic policies materially change their lives? Now, while I don't mind this question, it does marginalize our concerns to just the economy when the black male voter is concerned with much more. For instance, the attack on male masculinity and how everything that a man does is toxic or considered toxic. We're concerned with the infusion of trans women in female spaces, sports, the restrooms, etc. We're concerned with the indoctrination of our children. Our children should be learning STEM, not gender identity. We're concerned with the attack on the nuclear family and the clear divide that's been created between men and women. We're concerned with the border security situation and the immense amount of resources going 
towards the migrant situation rather than helping American citizens. We're concerned with our government infringing on our constitutional rights. But let's hear what Kamala Harris has to say about this. I appreciate the spirit of the question, but I'll tell you, I've often been asked this question in a way that I've had to respond by first saying that I think it's very important to not um, operate from the assumption that black men are in anybody's pocket. Get your hand out of my pocket! Black men are like any other voting group. You gotta earn their vote. So I'm working to earn the vote, not assuming I'm going to have it because I am black. But hasn't the Democrat Party always assumed that they'd get the black vote? I mean, Michaela Montgomery said it best. During the campaign, black people are a priority. During the administration, we ain't even thought about. But because the policies and the perspectives I have understands what we must do to recognize the needs of all communities. And I intend to be a president for all people. And she does emphasize all, just not Americans. But what baffles me is how undocumented people can get funded to the tune of thousands and American citizens can barely even get a business loan. The amount of effort that has gone towards housing, education, and food for the migrants is not even tantamount to the amount of effort put towards Americans. I started way before I was at the top of the ticket and what I called an economic opportunity tour focused on black men. Um, understanding that, for example, we have so many entrepreneurs in the community who do not have access to capital. I mean, as I stated, they could. Y'all just don't prioritize Americans. But they've got great ideas, an incredible work ethic, the ambition, the aspiration, the dream, but don't have the relationships necessarily. So my work has included as vice president getting billions more dollars into community banks, including working with the big banks to do that so that we can increase access to capital for our small businesses, for our startups. Part of my plan under my economic opportunity plan going forward. But I think I'm gonna stop it right here. It's 46 more minutes of babble. The Republican Party places the concerns of the American public first. It's as simple as that. But this is why most heterosexual males are looking towards the, especially black now, looking towards the Republican Party. They don't give handouts to anybody, but what they do is create opportunities. It's just up to you to seize it. Now we know that handout part is that's, that's cap because uh, tax breaks and all that stuff to wealthy guys who are millionaires, billionaires, they can afford to pay taxes, heavy taxes. Yeah, we, we know that's, that's cap. So he torn the line. Now, a lot of what he said is, is solid. However, that portion, I got, I got to speak up. I can't just let that ride. We not running with no black and brown coalition because brown getting the money and black ain't getting nothing but the black being used of us and our stats being used. Come on now. Us. That's right. So I encourage everybody Woo. that you think about how we love each, each other. other. And that's how when you fall out with one another, come on, you able to lay it aside. That's right. All right. Let's get it crack a lacking. Ladies and gentlemen. Everybody pile on in. You know what it is. It is that late night tap in with Tariq. Everybody fall through. Come on through and let's do what we do. It is that time. It is after 10 p.m. And you're probably listening to the playback sometime in the morning. Shout out to the people who's listening early in the morning. Shout out to the people listening overseas it's probably morning time over there so everybody come on in and let's do how we do while you're coming in the room everybody why don't y'all give me a good retweet retweet the space let everybody know that we're live right now let's take a couple of seconds it's going to take you about two and a half seconds to simply retweet the space everybody coming in i'm going to need you to retweet the space retweet it on your timeline and let everybody know that we're live right now ladies and gentlemen while people are falling in the room a lot of things we're going to cover tonight before we get the calls we're going to touch on the diddy charges we're going to go into that in a second yesterday we spoke a little bit on the arrest but now we're going to talk about the charges and before we do that, um, don't forget, go to rootworkstyle.com to get your rootwork deodorant. Shout out to all the regulars that's in the room. Shout out to Safia, um, to True Stasia, Miss Nikki the God, everybody follow my sister. Shout out to 
um, Sir Major. Shout out to the beautiful Amor. I see you, beloved. Shout out to FBA Goddess in the building. Shout out to Brother Grinds TV in the building. I got to give all the regulars the shout outs. I'm scrolling down. What's up, Ani? Brother Ani Asaru. Shout out to him. Shout out to Percy Earl. Everybody say Percy Earl. Y'all got to check out the last Bucci Bear episode. Percy Earl was doing his thing. Um, sh Let me see. Shout out to... See some other faces down here. People are still piling on in. What's up to Victor? I see Vic down there. So shout out to everybody. And another thing, I got to give a shout out to New Orleans. Um, did you guys see that beautiful second line that they did in New Orleans for Frankie Beverly? They did a send off for Frankie Beverly and they did the New Orleans second line where they, they dance down the street and they put together a second line to commemorate Frankie Beverly and him passing. And it was so beautiful. Oh, that was beautiful. Excuse me. It was like thousands of people on a Monday coming out. Everybody dressed in white, all celebrating and giving a send off to Frankie Beverly. They did it New Orleans style because uh, Frankie Beverly, I know he showed New Orleans a lot of love. I know he played out there a lot. And, you know, New, uh, um, New Orleans, that's a musical city. And the, the send off was just so beautiful, man. That's so beautiful. That's why I love New Orleans. You always hear me big up New Orleans. I really, really love New Orleans. Um, they they show love. If New Orleans rock with you, they rock with you. And that second line send off was just phenomenal. <clears throat> everybody on code, everybody doing their thing. So shout out to my NO folks. Shout out to everybody in New Orleans. I I, I want them to do, I, I want to go to some type of Frankie Beverly. Um, tribute show. There needs to be just one big show somewhere. That would be huge. Just a big tribute concert or something for Frankie Beverly, man. We really need that. But New Orleans really kicked it off. They really kicked it off with that second line. And I've been wanting to go to a second line out there in um, New Orleans. So next time I go out there, hopefully I can catch one and get in the mix. But I digress as far as that. Now, fam, what's up, Afro Elite? My brother Afro is in the building. What's up, Sister Wani? I see you, dear. Now, Diddy, let's let's get into the Diddy thing, man. Um, so Diddy, they they took him in the custody in the federal custody yesterday. Um, they're not giving him a bail. I think his lawyers tried to negotiate putting up fifty million dollars. For a bail, I think they tried to negotiate that, and they're not even taking that fifty mil. They're not taking that fifty mil, so we got to start reading in between the lines. What's really going on with these charges? Let's let's start being analytical for a minute, family, and let's just we're gonna take off the hater glasses because sometimes people look at things through the eyes of a hater. Because there's a lot of people who are kind of celebrating, oh, yeah, he he got what he deserved. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. And all of the the moist little soy boys who want to try to shame people for being analytic. Well, y'all niggas supporting Diddy. Yeah, whatever. Knock yourself out. Don't give a damn. Soy boy shaming don't work. I'm looking at this analytically. Something is real funny style with this case. And my thing is, I don't jump on the bandwagon. To, uh, this is nothing to celebrate. I'm not a hater. If you're celebrating just for the sake of celebrating, that's some hater shit. Yeah, let's be real. That's just some hater shit. It ain't about justice or the law. If you're celebrating the dude getting a fair charge, and people knew it was coming. They knew something was coming. And if you're celebrating just to celebrate, eh, that's some hater shit. Let's keep it above. Because you can sit up here and talk about, yeah, he did this and that to Cassie. Yeah, him whooping on it. That wasn't cool, but he wasn't charged with that. That's why I'm like looking at the charges, all the things in the media, all this of a Tupac this and whooping on Cassie. None of the, he wasn't charged with none of that. None of that is in there. 
So what's what's this really about? When they arrested them, him, and they had that Jamaican prosecutor, the 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 dude with that that janky hairline and that big head. That's a Caribbean prosecutor out there in Manhattan. He's talking about the charges. I'm like listening to the stuff they're talking about. They're like, yes, he was having, Diddy was having freak off parties. Oh, he was having, going all around the country, hiring prostitutes and having freak off parties. And they found 1,000 bottles of baby oil. I'm like, what? Okay. You guys acting like y'all got El Chapo when you're talking about kilos of baby oil. I right, Something ain't right with this. Y'all doing all of this grandstanding and there, I mean, he just kind of went on and on about freak offs and baby oil. I said, okay, well, something else is going on. You ain't doing all of this for no damn baby oil. Yeah, you're not putting all these resources in homeland security, raiding mansions and all this for no damn baby oil. Let's, let's just be real here. Take the hater glasses off for a minute. What's this really about? All that talking about freak offs and eh, it ain't about that because the charges really look kind of weak, to be honest. The charges are, it's kind of on some, I'm white and I say so, because I'm like, they're talking about trafficking and sex trafficking and all of that. And I'm waiting to hear if there are minors involved. There are no minors involved. It's coercion and prostitution and sex trafficking, but there are no minors involved. So there are a bunch of adults involved and dudes how you coerce a dude to give up some bussy who's an adult y you know what i'm saying how you coerce a grown nigga to give up some bussy unless he he wanted to do it you know and just grown people in general how do you convince grown people and coerce them into being in a freak off what are these charges about? Let's ask them some questions here. Because this is opening up some doors. If um what what kind of precedent is being set here? Because basically they're just showing that he was a freak. He's just a freaky dude. Is being a freaky dude worthy of a RICO charge? These are questions I'm asking. These are questions. And uh, not even defending the guy, not defending Puffy whatsoever, but we got to watch the precedence that's being set with these, these cases. Now, I know tethers are real big on, yes, get that nigga, because they look at that as a proxy for Foundation of Black Americans. So tethers are always rooting for um, the white authorities to, to take down some Foundation of Black American um, mogul. They're always rooting for that. And, but we, we're not looking at this through the eyes of a tether. We're looking at this from an analytical standpoint. What type of precedent is being set here? Because if having freak parties, if they're criminalizing that, well, shit, that's all the rappers. Because that's what rappers do. That's what people in the music industry do. They have freak parties all the time. They They do music videos and then... They got groupies, they go on tour, and people be in the hotel rooms doing whatever they do. And they go from state to state with groupies doing what they do. This is something that's typical in the music industry. Now, when they start trying to criminalize that and start throwing the Man Act, now I got questions because they, with Puffy, what they're doing, they're hitting him with the Man Act. That's the same thing they hit R. Kelly with. See, they dust the man act off for a lot of black entertainers. See, that's what I'm not feeling. See, I'm I'm looking at this thing from a precedent law perspective. They use this one particular law on black artists all the time, historically. And I got an issue with that. I had an issue when they did it with R. Kelly. They're going to use the man act on him. And that's a racist ass law that was literally created for black men. They created the Man Act for Jack Johnson back in the early 1900s when our iconic boxing legend Jack Johnson was winning all of them boxing matches, beating the brakes off of these white opponents. They couldn't beat him. You got to understand at the time, white supremacist society 
They really felt a certain way about that. When you can't get beaten in the ring, they'll beat you outside of the ring with the system of white supremacy. We saw that with Tariq Hill. With Tyreek Hill, he's on his way to a game, and they roughed him up outside of the, the stadium, down the street from the stadium, because they can't beat him on the field. And after they roughed him up, he went inside the stadium and won the game, by the way. But they've always had this thing with like Floyd Mayweather. You can't beat him in the ring, so you find some bogus charges. Oh, let's put him in jail for child support or whatever, or domestic violence, or whatever. Mike Tyson, same thing. We can't beat him in the ring, but we can put him in the jail for this or that. And they did that with Jack Johnson. When Jack Johnson used to win his boxing matches, the white supremacists would go around the country lynching people because of Jack Johnson beating people in the ring. He would beat white men in the ring, and then right after the fights, lynchings would happen around the country because they were so insecure and they needed a win. They needed some kind of psychological win, so they would go out and target some random innocent black person, like the cowards they are. So Jack Johnson was beating all of these white opponents and he was making a lot of money because people were desperate to see somebody white beat him. They were desperate for a great white hope, just like with Floyd Mayweather. That's why our brother Floyd made so much money. He made so much money because white people kept trying to pay to see him get beaten. White people kept trying to find somebody, an honorary white person to beat him, a Hispanic, a Filipino, just somebody non-black, please beat him. And it just never happened. Same thing with Jack Johnson. So Jack Johnson made a grip. This man had money falling out of his pockets, fancy cars, driving around, smoking cigars, smashing white women. And that really chapped their ass. You had this big black man beating the brakes off of these white men in the ring. And this is being transmitted all over the world. Then he leaves the ring, hops into a brand new car to go smash some white poontang. They couldn't deal with that. That really messed with them psychologically, and they couldn't beat him in that ring. So they had to create a law for him. They created something called the Man Act, the White Slave Trafficking Act. They created it for Jack Johnson, and also at the time, you had a lot of white women, especially white immigrants, coming over here choosing black pimps there were a lot of black pimps around the country that the white women were choosing up on so that was a problem so what they would say is that okay this is they're turning these white women into white slaves so the man act is called it was named after um uh, the guy i forgot his name charles man something like, i know his last name is man it's named after a, a political dude who was in chicago i think but the official law at the time was the White Slave Trafficking Act. They were like, you're enslaving white women. You're enslaving these white women with your big black pole. And if you take them across state lines, that's a federal crime. Driving around the country or flying around the country, basically with a white woman for immoral purposes, meaning you're going to smash that's illegal. Now, that law is very vague. That's a very vague law, but it's deliberately vague so that the white supremacists can arbitrarily enforce it whenever they want to. Who's to say what is immoral? Well, I'm white and I say so. If you see a white man and a white woman, no matter what she's doing, if she's being flued out, well, they're just having fun. That's, you know, there's just two people having a good time. If you see Hugh Hefner, doing what he's doing, having freak offs for decades with drugs and all types. I didn't heard a million stories coming out of that Playboy mansion. There's millions of stories coming out of there that if that was a black person, there would be Rico charges all over the place. You understand? But they leave that whole immoral purposes thing real vague. So that they can say, okay, if these black people are going across state lines, having sex with these different women, and there's some money being exchanged, well, they, oops, that's immoral. That's the man act. We can say that's trafficking. They were trafficked. That's some white not say so. So we gotta we gotta watch these laws. 
again, I told people when that R. Kelly thing and people were celebrating that R. Kelly thing, I said, hey, man, that law, they're going to, no, 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 they're dusting that, that man act off. If people go along with that, they'll start using that on everybody. And sure enough, that's what they're doing. Got to be very careful, especially if you're a black person. Watch these laws that they throw out here and you're celebrating. That's not no damn win. And, and much as some of y'all niggas like to trick your little money off. So hey, let's be real. I, you go down to Atlanta, the strip joints are filled with dudes tricking their money off. Y'all you know, love the strip joints. Y'all be up in them strip joints. Now, hey, man, let's say you you meet some stripper. And she turns you out and you want to get her flued out. Technically, if you come up in life and you get your money right and somebody saw you tricking off with that stripper, they can be like, hey, man, this dude was engaged in some immoral activity. And then I heard he flew the woman out. So now you can get caught up. I mean, that's just how easy it is. That's just how easy it is. If you want to be a freak which should be your prerogative. If you want to get some people to freak off and you want to trick your money off, you should, that should be your prerogative. But if there's some type of agenda, they can flip that and say, okay, man act that you, you went across state lines for moral purposes. So looking at the Diddy situation with these charges, so weak, these are weak charges. These are basically, I'm white and I say so charges because you're dealing with a bunch of consenting adults. Now, if there were children involved, that would be completely something different. That would be something different. But these were consenting adults. And it wasn't like the lie they were telling in the Bill Cosby case that drugs were being slipped onto people because Bill Cosby wasn't doing that either. I don't believe that Bill Cosby wasn't secretly putting stuff in people's drinks that that was all cap but diddy they're not saying he did that either they're just saying there were freak parties and there was drugs provided but the people were all coerced that's another thing what do you mean coerced what's the difference between consent and coercion when you're dealing with an adult see we got to ask questions here you, you understand if, if if you say hey let's go over here and I got some women over here and I want uh, everybody to get naked and rub some of this baby oil on your breast. And that's what I like. And you say, okay, I'm cool. Right, let's do it. W when does the coercion come in? This is a real question. When does coercion come in? What do you mean you're coerced if you're an, uh, an adult? If you're a dude, see, this is why when they got dudes involved and dudes making claims, if somebody comes up to you, like if T.S. Giselle comes up to you and says, hey, let me get a, I got a little crack of this bussy waiting on you. You got a choice to say, hell no, or hey, let me go check that out. Now, if you say, hey, let me go check that out. Did T.S. Giselle coerce you? You, you see what I'm saying? So the, the, the charges are like, on some I'm white and I say so. These charges are kind of it, there. It's a reach. And the, if the charges, if they're reaching like this, what's this really about? What is this really about? You know what this is about? Look, what this is about is that they found some tapes and it sounds like Diddy had tapes on people, some powerful people. This is what it's sounding like. It seems like Diddy had some tapes of some powerful ass people. And he has probably had these tapes he's been sitting on for years. And he's probably been leveraging these tapes to get little deals and um, political favors or whatever. He He's probably been, you know, letting folks know, hey, man, I got this in my back pocket let me get this um, liquor deal. Hey, man, I got this over here. Don't forget that little party we had. Let me get a couple of hundred thousand, hundred million dollars for um, a new studio or whatever. Or whatever. Now, hold on. Who is this Aisha person giving the thumbs down? Hold on, Aisha. You're giving the thumbs down. Are you trying to get my attention? Let me get you in before I finish my thought. Aisha, you want to hop in and chime in? Yes, I do. Because, sir, I want to know 
why are you saying as you're acting as if this man is not a criminal and i want to know why where are you from babe where's your accent from oh what does that matter we're talking about that that, that, ma that matters sure. where's your where's right, your right. accent from all right i'm somali there you go okay now well, i'm an I Sure. Right, right. You're an anchor baby with a big forehead. Yeah, we're, we're asking yeah, questions. But you're an OG anchor baby, right? No, no, I'm not an anchor baby at all. I'm a foundational Black American. I'm not yeah, a fleer. An OG anchor. I'm not a fleer like you, ma'am. And a lot of you tethers, you just want to see Black folks get taken out, period. The foundational Black Americans so that you can be the replacement. You want to be the Somali puffy. You want to be the big forehead diddy. So that's your thing. Just right, say you that. Can I speak or are you going to just speak? I'll, I'll put oh, my hand Okay, up. okay. Because you're not saying anything, ma'am. You're trying to be well, weird. But sir, I want to respond to you. Are you going to drop me? Right, right. But yeah, and you, 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 you the, that Somali tether you, you, you've called up before. Now, what do you have to say, ma'am? Anything constructive or you just want to bash that big forehead on the phone and just babble? No, What's sir, I'm name? not going to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to do that, sir, okay? I want to have dialogue with you. Then start dialoguing, ma'am. All right, all right. So why is it acceptable for Diddy to be doing these things? What did Diddy do? Diddy was out here abusing women, and I mean recording them and forcing them to have sex. How come, abu how come abuse wasn't, physical abuse wasn't in the charges? It was all prostitution and coercion. Because there is. He has parties and he does these things, sir. What does he do at these parties? He does what Jeffrey Epstein does. No, Jeffrey Epstein had underage people. Yes, 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 yes. Sir. Okay, but I'm just saying that. Yeah, I'm okay. Okay. Let, we're having a dialogue. What did, did he do at these parties that constitutes a RICO charge? Yeah, he beat these women and he made them take okay. drugs and have sex with these people, right? Okay. How come the beatings, the physical abuse, that wasn't, that's not in the charge? You can't sure. mix up stuff. I'm talking sure. about what I'm talking about what he was charged with. See, this is what we're not going to do. You're not going to bring up some stuff that's not in the indictments. I'm talking about what's in the indictments. And the media put out a whole bunch of stuff, but the the indictment were it was like coercion, prostitution, and drugs, and... But it is okay. coercion. If okay. he's... How so? How so? How do you coerce well, a grown these girl? women to do How? these indecent acts with these How? people that they How? don't How? want to do. How? How do you coerce, How do you coerce a, 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 an adult? Uh, sir, may I respond? Are you gonna yeah. Get How do you coerce an adult? They were coerced... Because uh, do you understand there's such thing as mental, you know, anguish? How do you do mental anguish on an adult? When you, sir, just because they're an adult doesn't mean they have the capability to act as an adult. So they're slow? They're looked as, as an adult by the government's eyes, but does not mean that what they go through does not make them act in a way that is very childlike, okay? That's a very simple thing. That's ridiculous, ma'am. No, but sir, sir, so you don't believe in these things, right? Okay. Well, I, I know. I'm not going to, I'm not going to punish y'all with that type of nonsense. Okay. Now, she's saying that they're all stupid, basically. No. No, no, see, people, you, this is why when you start asking questions, people can't really give nothing logical. How do you coerce an adult? Your, your adult can say yes or no. Hey, no, I'm not going to take that drug. What the fuck are you talking about? Coerced. If somebody, people, man, look, I've been in Hollywood. People offer me drugs all the time. Guess what I did? Said no. People offer me drugs and drinks all the time. I say no. Duh. What are people talking about? What is this? Stop acting dumb. Let's stop this dumbass talk. You can you can say no. People want you to go to little weird parties and stuff. You can say no. I, no, I don't want to go there. I'm good. Hey, man, we're hanging out at the after hour spot. 
No, I'm good. What's all this coercion stuff? Especially with dudes. A dude, how the hell you get coerced by another dude? What the fuck are people talking about out here? Yeah, I, I ain't buying all of that. It's too much I might not say so. Like I was saying earlier, with Diddy, this is what, what Diddy is. Seems like, man, they got some tapes. Sound like Diddy was using some type of these freak-off tapes or whatever. Because, you know, Diddy was infamous for all these parties, these these parties all over the place. So he he probably got some some tapes of some some high, powerful people, some prominent people, probably some politicians as well, doing some freaky, freaky stuff. And he's been holding it over their heads. And they, you know, went behind closed doors and said, hey, we're going to fix this. We're going to use our political machine, our media machine, and we're going to get him straight right before the election season. It's very interesting this happened right before the election. What does he have on people? What does Diddy have on the Democrats? Uh, what does he have? Does he have something on Kamala? Huh? Does he? I'm, these are questions. I'm, I'm just asking questions. What does he have on people? He got something on somebody where they needed to shut him up. When they got him in jail and they're not letting him get a bail, that's the way for them to say, hey, we're not going to let you talk now. Now that you're on the hot seat, we're not going to let you have access to a microphone or anything to get out here and start spilling the beans. Yeah. So what does Diddy know? What does he have on people? He must have something on some powerful people. And that's why he's been getting all of these very lucrative deals for the last 30 years. You know, they, they let you make a lot of money. He's been probably leveraging some videos because that's what they went and raided him for. They went to get some videos. So he's probably, he got some high profile people probably. There's some some big money bussy on some of these tapes, I'm assuming. Brother Afro Elite, hop on, brother. Tariq, how you doing? I'm good, man. How are you, brother? I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to say the person that you were referring to earlier with the main, the man act, his name is James R. Mann. Okay, there it is. James Mann. Yeah. Yes. yes. That's, that's the man. Um, oh. I'm going to say this. Uh, as far as the Diddy situation is concerned, a lot of people, what we need to understand is the balance between holding somebody accountable and then over punishing somebody. Yeah. So th that's why we're looking at the charges, because all of these charges are over punishing. This is overkill and overdoing it. Wow. People are like, well, yeah, well, look at what he did in the elevator. OK, well, yeah, what he did in the elevator does not justify him being over punished. And they do that a lot with black men. You slap somebody in the face, then they're facing capital murder. And wow. then they talk about, well, well, he shouldn't have slapped nobody. Yeah, but that's an over punishment, though. So we got to have the maturity to have that conversation. Absolutely. Real talk. Thank you. That's what I'm saying. Because, yeah, you talk about the elevator situation. OK, him whooping on Cassie. Yeah, that was horrible. Horrible. But that's not in the indictment, though. You understand? They'll show that and then charge somebody with something else. And it's like a RICO charge. Oh, hey, hey wait, 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 hold on now. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute. So we got to watch those little Jedi mind tricks. You know, I ain't with no Jedi mind trick at all. If, if somebody does something janky, charge them for doing, doing something janky. But if they're doing something that's pretty standard in the industry, you understand? You you having parties and people want to come and get down at your party. Okay, now you're criminalizing that. Now you're saying that's coercion. That's some might not say so. Because you're dealing with adults. Now you're dealing with adults. And adults, you got the option to say yes or no. Let's get um engineer something. What's your name, bro? Jim. My name is Jim. How's it going? What's up, Jim? How are you? Oh, I can't complain, man. So, you know, uh, I think it's pretty peculiar that people oftentimes, as you alluded to, actually, so you uh, caught on to this, don't understand that the 
majority of these things that happen to people of prominence, typically celebrities, is always um, not just the ulterior, ulterior motive or the desire to make an example of someone, but the question should be asked, who stands to lose? And that's really the simple, um, what it boils down to. Yeah. You know, who stands to lose from him saying something? And you did mention Democrats, and I think it's a fair point, because oftentimes you'll find people who are supportive of Democrats are those who uh, work hand yeah, in hand with them, and uh, they get a lot of benefits from the policies that they implement. Now, we shouldn't just stick to the federal level. Looking also at the local level, there's a tremendous amount of um, interactions, I guess to put it lightly, that happens on a local government level that allows people to do, well, whatever they want with unlimited reign. Because, you know, if you have control of the sheriff, if you have control of the agencies, they're going to be directly implementing laws against you or for you. It's all going to be on a local level. Yep. Yeah. All right, man. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you for your input, sir. All right. Very interesting. Very interesting. Shout out to everybody in here. A lot of folks coming in the room already. Over a thousand people in here. Let's get Dindu. Dindu, hop in, man. Mr. Damn, I'm surprised you brought me in, bro. Now, why are you surprised? Uh, I mean, I don't even really know at this point. However, here's here's what I had to say, man. Like we we got a lot of irons in the fire as a people, and the important thing is is that together we come. You know what I mean? And you've got to let go of this whole freedman, or excuse me, whole foundational Black American thing. We are freedmen. That's our lineage. We are freedmen. You can you can enjoy whatever you know whatever fruits that you've gained you've done a lot of good for the community man you have you built the hidden history museum you've got you know you've got you've done some great okay. things okay. Let's but go it's back. time to let go of the bullshit ah. and okay. come together as okay um i don't know if you got an earpiece in or whatever but no 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 you're gonna slow down and elaborate don't say nothing and then just start talking in circles slow down now, why should we let go of foundational Black American and just say Friedman? Why? Elaborate on that. Unmute your microphone, sir. You can unmute your microphone. I don't know if you're still talking or not, but unmute your microphone. There you All go. All right. So, yeah. Now I can. Now I can unmute it. However, um. Ask me the question again. Okay, because you're going to have to listen now. You said something. Yeah. I wanted you to elaborate. You said, we got to let go of foundational Black American BS. Now, why is that BS, and why should we let that designation go? Because we are, quite simply, without like elaborating on a whole bunch of other, you know, insignificant tangents, we are codified in federal law through more than one amendment as freedmen. Okay. So we use that too. I use freedmen and foundational black American interchangeably. They are not interchangeable. Yes, they are. No. It's the same group of people. No. Then what are you talking about? How For instance, there's a there there's a lady that made a submission to the OMB for uh, uh, through the federal. No, no, no! Stop! Stop! Answer the question: How are freedmen and foundational Black Americans two different people? I'm telling you, we're talking about the same group of people. I am a freedman, a descendant of freedmen, and I'm also a foundational black American. So what are you talking about? 
And I want you to be clear and concise. Don't go off on a tangent. Well, in the in the, the, the California legislature, no, no, no. And let's answer questions, sir. Our freedmen and foundational black Americans, two separate groups. Explain that. He's probably still talking. No, uh, no, actually, I did explain it. Okay, you didn't explain it. You were about to go off on a tangent. About uh, oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. It probably was. However, foundational black Americans and freedmen are different groups for one reason. Because a person who is a freedman is either a descendant of or directly freed from a variety of legal and illegal ways of freeing themselves from slavery. For instance, Frederick Douglass is a freedman. He did escape slavery, but in order to come back to the United States and do all the great shade, shit he did, he had to be, he had his freedom bought by abolitionists. Right. Not him to come and, back. And and that is what makes oh. him a freedman. And he was also a foundational black American. He descended from the people who built this country. He was not an immigrant. Mm -hmm. See how but, that uh, it just it just is there's too much intersectionality in the concept of foundational black American no, and no, freedom. No, we no, have to separate these things. No, it, no it's not. No, it's not. When you say foundational black American, that eliminates all of the intersectionality. When you say foundational black Americans, that's a Trump type term that other people can't tether on to. You understand? Now explain to me how that's true. It's true because number one, when you say foundational, that eliminates any immigrant claim. Immigrants can't hop on into it. When you say black, that eliminates some of the little sneaky $5 wannabes. The white supremacists can't latch on to it by saying, well, you know, I got a, my grandmother was kind of sort of mulatto. They can't latch on to it because black is a present term. And then when you say American, again, that eliminates some of the people who just came over. Okay. So when you say foundational black American, that eliminates the Caribbeans who try to latch on and say, hey, you know, we we are descended from slaves, too. We're freedmen, too, because, see, you have other people who try to they're trying to find a way to grab onto the freedman term. I've seen some white people try to latch on to the freedman term. So we got to be very careful with that. The only term that's really Trump tight that's untetherable is foundational black American. That's the one term. Now, when it comes to freedmen, Tariq, excuse me, I apologize for interrupting. But when it comes to freedmen, the care we need to take is making sure that that is never, ever associated with a race or an ethnicity hey. or anything like that it's it's so that is so fucking dire that it's that you and if you don't understand i mean maybe we can have a conversation in a different oh, you know, form but you know, you know, like i promise man you know let me slow you down we know this is why we have to know how to use certain terms interchangeably we got to know how to use certain terms in different locations. Interchangeable is just another word for intersectionality. Not. No, it's not. Because culturally, we are a race of people. We are black people and we're foundational black Americans. We do have a racial culture. We have that. And we have to acknowledge that. And we have to pay homage to it and show respect to our racial culture. We understand when we get into a courtroom, they've already set up things where you can't get certain benefits based on race. That's when the Friedman term comes in. So we know how to go for it from that perspective, but we're still talking about foundational black Americans, but we know how to codify the language. You understand? Other people know how to do that. And we're doing it. We know what we're doing. We know exactly what we're doing. So. The term foundational black American, perfect term. It's a term that don't nobody, they can't flip it like they can flip other terms, like descendant of slaves. They can flip that. Caribbeans try to latch onto that. 
technically they can. See, we got to watch that. The CARICOM people can hop in and say, hey, we're descendants of slaves, shit. And shit, we, we're kind of American. You see, that's why a lot of people, especially the tethers, they have a problem with foundational black American. The reason why is because they can't latch on to it. That's why they have a problem with that. But we use the terms interchangeably. Right? Dindu? And Dindu, hop on. Let me let me ask you something, Dindu. Dindu, unmute, unmute your microphone. All right, man. Ask me whatever. Now, Dindu, who's white? Your mother or your father? My mom. Your mom. Um, she's uh, 70. She's about 70% Cherokee and 30% white. My dad's. I mean, you can look on my page and just type dad, search it. You'll see. He's, he's blacker than you. He makes you look light skinned. And where's your dad from? Where's his people from? What part of the South? Uh, he is from Kentucky. Okay. And your mom, you said your mom is Cherokee. So well, yeah, she's $5. Huh? Uh, she might be a $5 Indian. Yeah. But, but my DNA doesn't doesn't support that claim. What did you, uh, your DNA says? What? what does it say? Well, it says a lot of things and I'm, and I'm not gonna, I'm not comfortable disclosing that in this, con in this context. Got it. Um, because the thing is, are you, cool? no, no, and it has nothing to do with my freedman status. I promise you that my thing or my, or my black or anything like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and, and pander to you motherfuckers about who and what I am. Let's slow down. Oh, God, cause you know, you're being light skinned. Okay, let's cut that. Well, well, you know, light skin, you know, light skin winning, baby. Okay, hold on, because you get into that angry light skin nigga shit. Okay, hold on, slow down. Well, he, well, he got into that light skin bag real quick. Okay, got to watch these little light skin niggas. Sometimes they're very sensitive. Okay, you got to watch him. He, that light skin anger. Well, let's let's slow down. All right. I don't recall being sensitive, but if because, that's how you take it. Listen, I don't want you to go into a beige rage. I don't want you to go into a beige rage. This nigga's. <laughs> All right, let's slow down because some of y'all niggas are deadly. I'm telling you, you better watch these crazy little light skinned niggas. They, they're not an easy win. You got to watch them. They're very dangerous sometimes. All right, y'all. Y'all heard about Matt Barnes went to whoop on Derek Fisher. Okay, <laughs> Matt Barnes drove like what 22 hours and didn't stop for gas or uh, snacks. He drove 22 hours playing light skin records. He played the best of DeBarge and Drake the whole way. So you do not underestimate light skinned niggas, um, but but here's the thing. This is why I, I asked. I knew that you had a, a a white parent, and I knew that you have a little mulatto thing going on. Are you cool with your black father? How close am I with my uh, freedman father? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I'm pretty close. You're pretty close. Real close. Like he raised me. Like after him and my mom got divorced. I went with her for like three months and I was like, wow, I can't do this. We lived in Cleveland, Texas. It was wow. wild. You know what I mean? And then we moved and then I moved back to Alaska. All right. Mm -hmm. And I lived with my dad. He was an Air Force guy. You know what I'm oh. saying? And and so was my grandfather. Well, he wasn't Air Force. My grandfather was a uh, army, but he was a staff sergeant in uh, Korea. And then he was a uh, little bit higher ranking in was also a uh, Green Beret in uh, Vietnam. And that's kind of probably how we ended up in Alaska anyway. You know, that's where they do the training, but we don't got to talk about that. Got it, got it. Now, my thing is this. You, you got the black dad here. Um, you got this thing. Your name is Dindu. Now, that's one of these terms that these... Oh, it's a beautiful name, ain't it? You like it, don't you? What's, now, what's that about? Now, why is that? Because, you know, that's disrespectful to your, your black dad. Uh, is it? Yeah, Isn't that's it? The, that's the well, I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I don't personally say the n word a lot, but a lot of people say they reclaimed that. So why can't I reclaim this? Well, no, it's not a reclaim. It's basically you're you're mocking black people, and it's more fun actually too. So because and it, it's less, it's actually more fun and less derogatory. So what's your problem? Well, the problem is that doesn't make you any more white. I think you do that. I'm not trying to be more white. Yeah, yeah, see, or more black. I'm just, I'm just enjoying who I am. No, because and that, you know, if you can't handle that, that's okay.
Oh, oh, he, oh let's, let's calm down the beige rage. Oh, the light skin shit kicks in. Let me, let's take a breather. Let's take a breather. Let's take a breather. Let's give, you need to go eat a light skin snack. Go bite on a Twinkie. You know, get you some light skin snacks and calm down. Got to calm him down. I don't want him to go into a beige rage. <laughs> You might need to calm down. Bro. You might no, no. need to calm down, calm down, and relax. Cause ain't there ain't no beige rage over here. Yeah, you doing all I got to do is hit the sun for a couple of days. But you know, when you when your bank account gets to a certain level, you 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 don't go outside as much. Just saying, I don't want to get you light skinned dudes triggered. I don't want you to throw no no baby oil at nobody. Yeah, just do light skin shit. But again, a lot of you guys, some of the tragic mulattoes, you try to pander to white supremacists by using these derogatory terms directed at black people, thinking that that's going to ingratiate you with the white supremacists. Um, Andrew Tate and his brother does that little goofy stuff. So no, I don't like them people like that, though. I don't like that. Like, the, I do entertain a couple of little white supremacists because it's fun. You know what I mean? And it's fun. It is fun. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a little bit of a troll sometimes, too. So, you know, don't don't think that, like, I'm super serious. But for the but, position that you're trying to take in the community. But just understand, that's not going to ingratiate you with the white supremacists. I, just I don't want... give a fuck. Okay, let's calm down. Oh, oh, let me calm oh. let's bite a Take a bite of a honey bun. Calm down. Calm down. It's okay. Let me calm him down. I don't. I don't want that light skin blood pressure to go up. Let's calm down. All right. Think of Al B. Shore's album. Think of something soothing and light skinned. All right. All right. Let me calm him down. I don't, again, you got to really talk to light skinned niggas a certain way. Um, my thing is this, brother. I don't want you to sit up here trying to pander to the white supremacists because they look at you as a bigger threat than a full foundation of black American like myself. That's what I'm saying to you. I just want you to be safe out here because a lot of you tragic mulattoes sit up here and bussy pop with these white supremacists and they hate your guts secretly. So I don't want you to get caught up. You understand? I, I do, and I appreciate you looking out for me like that, brother. Yes. I really do, man. I, I, really I, do. Got a couple I don't of know what I would do I got, if I, I didn't have somebody like you teaching me how to be black after living 37 years as a black man. And right, because listen, I have light-skinned sons. A couple of my sons are light-skinned, and I have to tell them all the time to stop doing a little light-skinned shit. You understand? Sometimes they do. They do light-skinned shit. You know? I have to tell them. I have to let them know. One time my son went outside. He was in the backyard in his underwear and some Crocs. I said, get your ass in here and stop doing that light skin shit. Don't do that. Don't go outside in your drawers and your fucking Crocs. We don't do that. We're foundational black Americans. Get that bullshit up out of here. You know, so you got to check your kids sometimes. You know, I, so I got light skin kids. So I know I talked to them about doing light skin shit. So I'm talking to you the same way. So because I want you to thrive. So anyway, Dindu, I appreciate you, man, for having the conversation, brother. Um, any last words? Go ahead, sir. Dindu, go ahead, brother. Dindu, where you at, man? Uh oh, I can't hear him. Oh, there we go. You there. you finally unmuted me, so I could. Anyway, but I'm not going to even talk about that. Hey, man, you know what? All the bullshit aside. I appreciate you letting me get up here tonight. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a forum where everybody can come and speak their peace. You understand? Yeah. And, uh, and I don't mean anything but peace and love for all of our people, brother. And I don't care whether you call yourself foundational or ADOS or Sulon or whatever the fuck you want to make up. The reality is we're all freedmen. And as long as we, in our hearts, understand that that's the lineage that matters to get us to the goal that we all have in common. So be it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, then, do man, you be good, and I'm gonna go ahead and let you. I'm gonna let me send me your address. I'm gonna send you the best of Christopher Williams. I got some light skin CDs that I'm gonna send you, brother. All right, thank you so much. All right, but listen, I want y'all to understand something. Um, one of our goals is reparations. That's one goal. The primary goal is just black empowerment. See, reparations, that's not the end all be all. That's just one lever of power that we're trying to reach. That's just one goal. 
our thing is just complete foundational Black American empowerment. You understand? So us recognizing our foundational Black American lineage, that's important to do all the time inside and outside of the court. We practice our lineage empowerment all day, every day. You understand? Our lineage is our lineage. We are a unique lineage. And we're supposed to recognize that, just like everybody else recognizes their lineage. Yeah? So we got to be very clear on that. And again, so many people have a problem with us recognizing our lineage because we've designated our lineage in such a way where people cannot tether on to it. You understand? That's a power move. So they can't remix anything. They can't slip into our lineage. They can't try to cosplay as us. We've excluded people. See, power is about being able to exclude let me tell you something. The most powerful word is no, not yes. No. When you can start saying no with your full chest, that's where the power is. Yeah, you're going to ruffle feathers. See, when you start saying no, you, you, you get enemies. Sometimes enemies are cool. Ain't nothing wrong with a, a cool enemy. Like our brother Nipsey said, sometimes we need strong enemies. I don't mind a damn enemy. We've been trying to be friends with everybody too damn long. We've been saying, yes, come on over here. Yes, we'll take you in. Yes, we, you can join us. if you. Yeah, we created hip hop, but yes, you can say you created it too. Now, we, we've been doing that yes bullshit too damn long. Letting people come over and run over our ass. I'm good. I, I step up and say, no, quick. No, your ass didn't create this. No, you didn't do that. No, you didn't. Because I'm going to tell the truth. Going back to New Orleans, this whole thing now, some of the tethers, now that uh, Haitians are on the hot seat right now, they're trying to drag us in to, to protect them and all this. And they keep trying to flip these narratives about New Orleans. Well, in New, well, y'all niggas are not standing up for Haiti. You know, most of the black people in New Orleans are actually Haitian. Like, No, they're not. No, they're not. That's like a new lie that they're trying to run with. That No, they're not. And then some of the tethers, they found some interviews I was doing around 1804. See, you were saying, look at you bigging up Haiti. Yeah, I give Haiti props. The Dessaline and those guys, I give them props. I'll talk about some of the influences that came from Haiti and the Caribbean that touched in parts of New Orleans, because, yeah, New Orleans was a port city, so there were influences coming in from the Caribbean and other places. But New Orleans is New Orleans. That's a foundational Black American city. The culture is foundational Black American. Don't get it twisted. Yeah, there's influences from different places here or there, but there's no other place like New Orleans. That's that FBA energy. You got people talking about, would well, the food from New Orleans come from Haiti? What, what, what? Food, you know, some of us, we've been to Haiti. The food over there in Haiti don't taste nothing like the food in New Orleans. What, where are y'all getting these lies from? Y'all act like we ain't been over there. I, I done been to Haiti several times. No disrespect. I, I got love for the Haitian people. It, it's, it ain't nothing like no damn New Orleans. All right. It ain't even the same. It ain't the same. Yeah, you got certain language things here and you know, the Creole there. A little very small, minute um, um, things because of the French. You know, it was a French colony there, the French colony over there in um, the French territory of um, Louisiana. But saying the food, no, no. The Haitian food don't taste nothing like New Orleans food. The music don't sound nothing alike. We ain't going to lie. I'm not going to let nobody lie. Y'all not about to sit up here and lie. We're not doing that. You see, it's all about speaking truth to power. Speaking truth to power. Speaking of truth to power. Did y'all see Andrew Schultz? Andrew Schultz was, um, I don't know if it was his podcast. It was somebody's podcast. And hold on. Andrew Schultz 
had these non-FBA dudes on there. And they were talking about black women. And then Andrew Schultz started really doing jokes and kind of insulting black women. You know, doing his little old racial bullshit that he does. And those non-FBA dudes were just kind of sitting up there cock-eyeing and kikin. And then people got on those brothers' cases for sitting up there laughing at that shit. A lot of, and those brothers, and those, and I'm saying brother loosely, those black men who were, were those immigrant men, they ended up having to do a video apologizing for sitting up there cock-eyeing and kikin while Andrew Schultz was going in on sisters like that. And they're sitting up there laughing and not saying nothing. See, this is why I tell people why the white supremacists, they prefer non-FBAs to be around. This is what I'd be saying to people. They prefer the non-FBA people because they can say, the white supremacists can say their little racial stuff around them and they'll sit there cock and key about it. You know what I'm saying? That's why they like to have them around. Listen, y'all seen me debate Andrew Schultz. I gave his ass that work for like 45 minutes straight. I was off in his ass. I wasn't letting him get away with saying none of that bullshit around me. When I was there with him, I was lighting him up for like 45 minutes straight with history, debunking all of his little old, um, alt-right talking points. I lit his ass up. You understand? So yeah, they they know not to get around people like me and some of you guys in here. They know who to get around with that nonsense. They know who's going to check them and who's not going to check them. You see, that's why we're different. We are different. Foundational Black Americans, we got a different energy, man. We got a different energy. We A lot of that bullshit, we don't let fly. We do not let none of that stuff fly. Yeah. Let's get Beth in the building. Hold on, wait. Let's Beth, hop in, Beth. I haven't heard from you in a minute. Ah, bigoted Beth. Finally, I get a chance to speak. My goodness. Now that Urkel's done speaking. Um, I have a serious question. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, sir. So we went through um, Hillary Clinton with her 30,000 emails that she scrubbed and burned or whatever. Oh, yeah. And then there was the Wiener laptop or whatever his name is. You've got the Epstein Island. You got Hunter's laptop. Why do we think that something is going to come out of this Diddy thing? And I'm being serious. I've been following all these stories and all of these um, situations for the last, you know, I don't know, five, six, seven years. Do we really think something's going to come out of this? I don't. What are your thoughts? Okay, so what do you think it's about? Why do you think they're making such a big grandstand about going after Diddy with these little baby oil charges? You know, because it, it ain't about no baby. Thing to do with our society over here. So you're just wishing... No, you probably got dick from the Wishing for the downfall of Puffy as a proxy for us so that we can eventually be living in shanty towns like you. That's what that's about. That's just cultural jealousy, sir. Do you travel, Tariq? Um, do you use deodorant? Hmm? Hop on, sir. Because y'all kill me over there in Johannesburg worrying about FBA business. Why don't you worry about getting them white supremacists off? So if you, if no, you, you listen on some real talk, you're ninety percent of the population getting a foot up in your ass by what seven percent of the people there. Why don't you worry about that instead of worrying about Diddy and making up some shit about our lineage? Why don't you get them white supremacists off your neck? While they're sitting across the street living in condos in Europe, they're in a shipping container, boiling a damn hyena. But I don't live on food stamps. But I don't live on food stamps. You see, that's the thing. Most yeah, of the yeah, yeah, no, yeah, you know, you you can't get food stamps, sir, because all the white people got your resources. So you you have to stamp food. You got to go out there and stomp on a, a cheetah. All right. 
Yeah, you don't get food stamps. You got to stamp food. You got to stamp on a, a baby giraffe and then boil it. So you have to stamp on food, sir. That's the problem. But our, but our, at least our population's not in prison, like your population. Sir, they, so, sir, sir, come on. Sir, they've turned your townships into open air prisons, sir. They've turned your societies into prisons. That's what those townships are. Sir, I've been to the townships. Those are open air prisons. They got military tanks out there while you're sitting in them shanty towns, barbecuing your bush meat outside of your little shanty while you're defecating in the damn streets and the white people over there around the block living in condos. You're in an open air prison, sir. And you're the majority. Um, Peter is going down. Where do you like her? You're going, you've already been down. So you need to worry about getting up. All right. The last thing on your mind should be some damn P. Diddy. You need to worry about being 90% of the population getting smashed down by a handful of white supremacists over there. That's a bad look. And you're up here worried about some damn Diddy. You need to shimmy your ass over there and get the resources from them white supremacists who's whooping down on you, sir. You understand? Giving you dick. Well, they're giving you the pipe. You're getting buck broken over there to get you a couple of breadcrumbs. And you're the majority over there, sir. You understand? You're sitting over there spreading your bussy for white men to get a couple of crumbs. And you don't know how to stand up for yourself. Instead of standing up for yourself, you're over here whining about what we got going on, sir. Come on now. Don't you know how pathetic that looks? That looks pathetic, sir. You understand? No, chief. No, 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 chief. You you look pathetic. You you are blind trying to lead the FBA blind who follow your shit. You pathetic. So relax yourself, Chief. Relax yourself. You the one who's pathetic. You're defending nonsense. You're defending someone who's abused people like P. Duddy. What Sir, kind of you're abused over there. They abuse your ass. That's probably why you believe all of the abuse allegations, because you're a battered bitch. That's the problem. You see your yeah. Sir, where do you the South African Okay, you're the South African Cassie. You see yourself through the eyes of a battered woman because that's how you carry yourself. You don't carry yourself like a man. You ain't standing up to them little handful of white supremacists. See, we're foundational black Americans. We're 12% of the population and we still stomp down on white supremacists. We'll still step to them. You understand? But you over there, you're the majority. And the white supremacists kicking you dead in your ass. And you feel like a bitch. And that's why you calling us advocating for women's rights. Because you feel like a woman inside, sir. Because you've been made into a bitch. A little old ashy, musty, shea butter wearing bitch. And you're trying to project your failure onto us, sir. And shout out to my South Africans. I got some good folks over in South Africa. But you have these type of dudes right here who's very moist, bitch-made, and feminine who does God knows what to get a job from one of them white supremacists over there. Um, do you be working that mouth to get you a little job? Do you, you be using your indigenous language, using clicks and pops while you got them dudes' balls in your mouth? Do you be doing all that? <laughs> You be doing clicks and pops on the white man over there, bro. Come on, South African patriot. Talk to me, brother. Come on, clicks and pops. Look, Sarik, you can throw your tampons all around, but Peter is going down. Where do you like it or not? We were watching the following. And we were watching the your bush meat is going down. And the street turds need to go down. All right. That's what you need to do is build a toilet to get them street turds up out of your community. 
okay? You worrying about Diddy going down. Them street turds need to go down. You're running around there defecating in the streets of South Africa, sir. And you're worrying about Diddy. You need to worry about shitty because that's what you are. You're shitty walking around defecating all over the place. So please stop worrying about Diddy and stop being shitty, all right? Are you good, sir? Okay, he left. Okay, I think that was one to you. He bounced. I think the last one really cut a nerve. <laughs> the last one really touched a nerve. He got the hell out of here. Yeah, that last one really touched a nerve on him. Yeah, he got out. I didn't take him out. He got out. All right. Well, don't come talking about us. And y'all got feces all in the damn streets. The hell out of here. And shout out to South Africa. I love my South African family. I got good folks out there. But come on now, you ain't gonna have no this dude call up with the bullshit. Got my sister Brooke in the building. What's up, beloved? Hello, good night. How are you? Good dear. How are you, my love? I'm good. You know what I I would keep forgetting to tell you that um that mango uh a uh, root work. Yes. I love the smell of that. It is so amazing. And I, I always forget to tell you because I just want to make my point to get off. Thank you so much, dear. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Um, okay. So when that guy was talking about um the Hugh Hefner. Hugh Hefner was accused of doing all types of things, of <laughs> drugging women. He had a similar setup where he would have these parties and have cameras in the rooms, um, drugging women against their women and girls for like, what, 70 years? Okay. <laughs> women and girls for years. So when he was trying to compare the two, it just didn't make sense to me because Hugh Hefner has been accused of just about everything under the sun, but he never did one day in jail. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Oh, man, man, I didn't heard personal stuff about girls that then went up there in that Playboy Mansion. I didn't heard all types of stuff. I won't even repeat it here. But there's been allegations about Hugh Hefner in that Playboy Mansion for years. And they, they treat that man like an icon to this day. And what's up? We got um, Donald Trump News. What's up, Donald Trump News? What's going on? Go ahead, Donald Trump News. Unmute your microphone. Unmute your microphone. Unmute your microphone. If you'd like to speak. Okay, Donald Trump. Okay, he didn't want to speak. All right, let me get um, A Kits in here. Then I'm going to get Brother Terrain. A Kits, what's up, brother? Yo, Tariq, what's happening, man? I'm good. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So, like, that last dude you talked to, you absolutely eviscerated him. But, like, you're obviously not defending Diddy, as you said. You're right right you're just you're you're looking at the legal precedent that could be set from this um uh, which is most definitely understandable but um they dropped a memo today um and you were asking just to kind of answer questions you were saying about the drugging and the specific i'll read you the second paragraph of the ch sex trafficking and abuse paragraph okay um <clears throat> the defendant ensured the defendant ensured the victims would participate in freak offs through coercion and violence. For instance, the defendant provided controlled substances, including ketamine, ecstasy, and gamma, how do you pronounce that? <laughs> I can't make this up. Gamma hydro, hydroxy booty rate. Well, damn. <laughs> to, really to, to female victims so that, yeah, hyd maybe I'm pronouncing that wrong, but it's GHB. Okay. To female victims so that they could and would continue uh, both during freak offs and separate from freak offs. So yeah, bro. It's... Yeah. So yeah, it wasn't yeah. a thing where he was actually drugging people or putting drugs in people's drinks or nothing like that. That's and I know that wasn't in there because that wasn't the thing. It was basically yeah, he's having parties and there's drugs at the parties, which is typical for them for Hollywood and music parties. That's very typical. No, I, I ain't defending that at all because I don't. But that is that a crime? So when did it become a crime? Because that's typical in Hollywood. You go to parties and they got drugs all over the place. They invite you. Hey, man, we got women and drugs. Come on down. You party, you smoke, you drink. Come on down. 
So when now it's a crime. Now, when is it a crime and when is it not a crime? And I'm not defending anything because I'm a person. I don't drink. I don't smoke and I don't do any drugs. And I don't go to freak off. So I don't do the freak off thing. I'm not trying to be in a room with a bunch of people doing all I don't. I don't do none of that shit. But if somebody wants to do that. And everybody's consenting. They should be able to do that. Right. Brother Terrain, hop in. What's good, Tariq? How you doing this evening? I'm good, brother. How are you? I'm good. You remember the movie Eyes Wide Shut, Stanley Kubrick, 1999? Yeah, they was talking about them freak off little parties and sex parties and stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I would advise anybody who can to download that movie and watch it. That whole thing about sexual underworlds that are going on in, around the very ultra wealthy and people who have the money to do that sort of thing, that is almost like a rite of passage for a lot of people in that world. It started out in like high upper echelon societies and then they started moving into like you know sports and like entertainment people who have money to do those sorts of things but this is something that's well known and it's something that's been well known has been talked about for the longest especially like around hip-hop you had pimp c talk about it dave chappelle has alluded to it cat williams talked about it um nori talked about it even with the diddy stuff so the thing it sounds to me like just the fact that this black man is in the midst of all that now that's not my thing but it kind, of, it kind of seems like it's become sort of like a rite of passage for wealthy white men. And now that wealthy black men are starting to do this sort of thing, now it's an issue. I'm not saying I'm not condoning anything he's done if he's done anything illegal. But it's kind of funny that this is the thing that's got everybody shocked and horrified when people know these things go on. And they've been going on since the 1950s. Absolutely, man. A very good point. And also, man, in Hollywood, man, here's the thing. Here's the thing in Hollywood. Hollywood, they... They've never really liked the the black playboy thing. They've always had a, an issue with that. That's why if you look at Hollywood, the black men who really um, have longevity in Hollywood are the ones who are... <laughs> ones who are God damn, E.S. Damn, I'm trying to make a point. E.S. Yes, yes, sir. What, what's going on? What's all in the... Noise in the background. Oh, my fault, my fault. Nah, my fault, my G. Listen, uh, my take on the P. Diddy situation is that I think that honestly, truthfully, he should have just had kept Cassidy dealing with Cassidy alone. Meaning, like he should have just dealt with her and not with the security lady, the the Asian girl. Because these, if he would have dealt with Cassidy, none of this stuff would have got out or with the elevator situation. Or he shouldn't have settled. He shouldn't have settled after the fact when everything mm -hmm. got blown up to the uh to the new, um news network. He should have just settled underneath. Gave her what she needed and left her and left things alone like that instead of him waiting till everybody knowing it didn't settle because now it opened up doors for everybody to start, you know, putting their lawsuits out against him and all these crimes. That that's on one take. The other take is is that they overcharged him. The reason why they overcharged him, so something could stick on him so he could plead out or, or find him guilty on something. So that's the reason why they overcharged him on certain cases on what he's going through now. But that's just my take on it, though. Okay. <coughs> Damn, brother. We got a lot of noise going on. But like I was saying earlier, um, in, in, for black men to have some kind of longevity without getting into too many scandals, mm -hmm. uh, black men have to be married. Like Will, Will Smith, he hasn't been in any, like too many scandals because he's married. Denzel Washington, not too many <laughs> But that's that's a very important precedent. And Empress, hop can on. You hear, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. What's going on? You got a lot of noise going on over there, dear. You all right? I am doing good. I love you much, Detroit love. We support yeah. you. I want to take time to thank you for enlightening us. I've learned so much since following you. I do oriental astrology and I'm going to give you my take on it with this being the tail end of the year of the dragon. You know, dragon is a reptile just like snake. When it gets into that snake going into January, you're going to really see things come out of nowhere, not just on the P. Diddy, but on a political aspect that's going to be brainstorm. And Tariq, with you being a cancer, you should always follow your third eye. You are a gifted 
profit and you don't get your credit. I always speak up for you in all aspects because so many is jealous of your game. I miss Bucci Bear. That's my favorite. Yeah. You have brought a lot of um, love and joy when I was going through depression and you may not know it, but look into when that year the snake comes, you're going to see so many famous people being exposed that those that's doing the exposing like a snake when it attacks is venomous and is deadly. You're going to see a lot of people corruption being exposed and a lot of violence under that year of the snake. Wow. Now, ironically, when you look at the Zodiac, dealing with Trump versus Kamala. Ironically, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Kamala is born that year of the snake. Did you know that? And Trump is born the year of the dog. He's a double air sign. Mm -hmm. With him being that double air sign, he can flip it at any given time and you never know how to take him because that's double air. You don't know if it's going to be frosty. You don't know how it's going to be. Michigan is one of those states that's a Gemini state. If you, you've been here, you know the weather can be nice and warm and flip and be freezing and flip unexpected. And this is what you're going to see in the year of the snake. So many people are going to start fleeing to your knowledge because you spit now real game. But if you don't want to give the reparation is going down in their demise. When I watch Kamala keep skipping around the subject, she has no intention. She's using the community once she gets in and they see how she is. Under that year of the snake, people will turn venomous. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, dear. Yes. Yeah, I was born in Michigan. Yes, I was. Oh, I know about that weather out there. I was born in Michigan. And um, I, I think I used to post some of my, my baby pictures when I was a small child in Michigan. I used to, I posted some of the pictures from the 70s when my mom my mom would have me dressed like goddamn Nicky Barnes. My mom would have me dressed like Frank Matthews. She would dress me like a little drug dealer. I had on, I was like three years old with three-piece leisure suits on with a vest. I don't know why my mom would dress me like a Harlem drug dealer as a toddler. I'm like, where did I get these clothes from? Where the hell did I get a whole three-piece suit at two years old? Yeah. Well, I had on the outfits. I looked like one of the four tops in going to preschool. But um, shout out to Michigan. Yeah, that's my, that's where I was born. I was born in Detroit. Yes, indeed. And speaking of Kamala and then the reparations, did you guys see Kamala at the uh, National Association of Black Journalists? They had a thing up there in Philly and they had her splaining. And the reparations came up and Kamala did the whole pivot. She was on there like, yeah, well, reparations, you know, we should have a study. You know, I want to do a study. And, you know, the thing about reparations, you know, that's why I want the Affordable Care Act, you know. So everybody can benefit, you know. She she pivoted from reparations to some lift all program for every damn body. Like, man, if that woman don't get the whole hell out of here, we ain't doing that study stuff. We ain't with it. We ain't studying nothing. The the immigrants who are flooding over here, they ain't getting no damn study. These people are getting all types of damn debit cards and EBT cards. They're getting some some tangibles. They ain't studying nothing. You're giving all of our tangibles away to all of these non-citizens, and then we get a study? Study these nuts. That's what you study. You stupid as hell if you vote for some damn Kamala and if you're a foundational black American. Now, a tether, I know why they would. 
There's no way we should vote for her. That woman's a moron. All right, let's get Beast in the building. Beast? What's happening, Tariq? What's going on, Beast? How are you, bro? I'm good, brother. I'm good. You know what? You stole my thunder. I was going to come come back Kamala. I was was, was like, hey, when are you going to talk about that Kamala? Because I watched that interview in shock. Oh, yeah, I wasn't even shocked when she started, when she well, brought up, I said, oh, she's about to pivot. Mm-hmm. And then she started talking about reparations. Like, oh, yeah, a study and, what? You know, oh, Lord. Well, that word salad, man, I, I, man, my goodness, my goodness. I was watching it with my wife and we were both watching it. Wow. Like, how can anybody vote for this bitch? <laughs> man I, I hey dude uh, black folks black folks i don't know oh, the, the divine nine boule types yeah those are the only people i see i to be honest i don't see in real life i don't see no real life kamala supporters i, I do not see in real life in real life where are these kamala supporters i never see them i swear to god I meet more black people who are supporting Trump, like in the streets, like just straight up. Like we we, we had an event at the museum, and I had a lot of black people telling me, hey, "Like we gonna we we gonna rock with Trump." I I do not know any black people in real life who's really rocking with Kamala, and like like older black people, older black people. You know they they're gonna vote blue no matter who because they don't want their Medicaid messed up. That's what they think. They think if they vote for anybody but a Democrat, their Medicaid is going to go away, so they won't be able to get their prescriptions. They, they, the fear mongering works on old black people. They scare the head out of old black people. Are, they, they believe everything they see on the news. Anything the Democrats put out, they believe it. Anything you, you know, there's going to be some forest fires and an earthquake that's going to kill everybody next Monday. You know, they, anything that's said on the news, they believe it. But I don't know black people who are really supporting Kamala Harris. I don't know any in real life. Shannon, what's going on, ma'am? Well, I'm not black. I'm a Southern girl, but I was mm-hmm. born in Detroit, Michigan, Franklin County. Oh, there you go. There you go. And grew up in the South, Appalachian Mountains. But what, what, what state did you grow up in? Virginia. Virginia. Okay. There you go. Yep. Not the eastern part of Virginia, not Loudoun County. It's, you know, surrounded by Virginia, uh, West Virginia, Tennessee, you know, those mountains. Right, right. I right. live in Arizona now, right? Mm-hmm. Big change. <laughs> but, you know, I travel across the country for my job, and I see and talk to people. And I am, between me and my husband's income, we're probably better off than most, but this economy is hitting us hard, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I have two children that have babies on the way. Thank God. God bless them, right? So so your children have babies on the way? Yep, my children. I'm going to be a great grandparent, um, <laughs> a grandparent, actually, um, January and March. Well, congratulations. Now, you, in your picture, you don't look that old. How old are you? I'm 51. Okay, there it is. Yep. Oh. Um, but we're all feeling it. We're all feeling the gas prices and the economy and grocery bills. We're all feeling it. We all see it. I'm in Tucson right now on yeah. work, and it, actually, the cost of living here is way less, and I went to the grocery store, and I was like, wow, <laughs> you know, it's way less than where I live, um, but I think the average American is going to vote based on, were you better off five years ago, four and a half years ago? Or what? what is painting you now? Yeah. And I work for a government su- subsidiary. 
So I know what's coming down the line for one, two, three, four, five years. And based on the Biden Inflation Reduction Act, which is not going to be good for people, the average American. Mm -hmm. And I feel for those people that are on a fixed income, that are on Social Security. Because these guys, these guys are starving. Yeah. And I go into their homes and I meet with them. And I can't say what's coming across the pike, you know, because of guidelines, government guidelines that I can't discuss. But if this doesn't get re redacted, we are in a real hurt coming down for 25, 26. I'm telling you. Yep. There you go. Well, thank you so much, beloved. Um, interesting information. Let's get um metaphor in here. Metaphor. Uh, thank. Good morning, brother Tar uh, Tariq. It's it's morning here. Um, uh, if you allow me to to look at uh, a PDD's case from a legal point of view, um, as a, a, a defense lawyer for seventeen years. Are you in the UK? I know. I'm in Austria. Uh, I'm in Austria. Austria is a country somewhere in, in Europe. It's, it's a neighboring country. I, I, I beg your pardon? You're near Germany, right? No, I'm not German. I'm not German. No. No, near Germany. Austria is near Germany. Yeah, right? near Germany. That's correct. That's correct. Right. Austria is near Germany. Okay. It's, it's a neighboring country to Germany. Okay. How long have you been over there, by the way? Uh, I've been here since 2019. And you're from what part of Africa? You're from? Okay, I'm I'm Nigerian British. My parents are Nigerians, but I was I was born in the UK. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So break down from a legal standpoint. Okay, I was just trying to look at it from a legal standpoint because I've been a, I've been a defense lawyer for for many years, and I was looking forward to hearing um, um, the DA, you know, unseal that indictment. I was particularly looking for real evidence that. Uh, put Mr. Combs in these uh, um, offenses that has been alleged against him, you know. And I have to say that what the DA, DA I mean, the DA's uh, um, uh, statement yesterday, you know, in my opinion, uh, does not um, clarify that. Although it may, it may give an indication that an offense has been committed around this man's premises, but it does not uh, clarify that the man. Um, is the offender, you know? So, um, and like you rightly said, I think people need to uh, draw some, you know, facts here. Uh, this man is, is a public figure, and he's well known, and he does a lot of parties, like many other famous celebrities do, you know. And these kind of things can happen within their territory. I think for them to really have a case, they need to put this man in the actual offense that they've alleged against him. And I was looking forward to the DA. You know, expounding and displaying this evidence that actually put the man in the offense. You know, I didn't see any. You know, so that's just all I wanted to say there. Um, but he also said that the investigation is still ongoing. Look, what really. Yes, thank you so much. I ain't gonna land you playing because sometimes these guys just be babbling. But yeah, that was my whole thing, man. My whole thing with the Diddy case, you know, they got this, they had this big build up, like an indictment might be coming. I'm like, okay, they're doing these raids. And I'm thinking, okay, if an indictment is coming, they're going to talk about all the cocaine and all of the drugs they found and <laughs> sex tapes and kids. And okay, and they do a press conference talking about freak offs and baby oil. I'm like, okay, <laughs> right. all that. Hell, okay, I, let me, I got some baby oil. Do I need to throw this shit out? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> What's up? How are you, dear? I'm doing well, Tariq. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Um, yeah. I just wanted to touch on something to ask you specifically. Do you think that the charges with Diddy, do you think that all this is coming up right now at this specific time to kind of take the focus off of the election as kind of a, like a smokescreen? Uh, because, you know, they've been sitting on this information for a pretty long time and they haven't done anything with it and they still haven't told us anything specific. Right. I'm thinking 
maybe it doesn't have something to do with some elected officials. Exactly. Like, are they scrubbing evidence so that they can arm this this case for, you know, like an October surprise type situation? Yeah, I, it's it's just weird, the timing of it. And again, the allegations are, to me, it's just weak. It's if, still very, very vague. And, and that's I, what we want to know. Like, what is it that you guys know that you're not telling us? If, it, if it's that big of a deal that you've brought it to light once more, then why aren't you being more specific? Exactly. Because my thing is, if they're just the worst that they're talking about, when that that prosecutor was doing the press conference, he just went on and on talking about freak offs and all of this baby oil. And I'm like, if that's if that's your go to narrative, y'all really don't have nothing. So what is this really about? That's my thing. And what precedent is being set legally for them to have these vague charges and they're throwing these serious um, indictments, you know? So, you know, I'm all about what precedent is being set. I just want to make sure that the wrong precedent is being not being set. All right. Shout out to everybody in here. We are in here. There's almost 1,500 people in the building tonight. We are in here deep and heavy. All right. Let's get um Biden's meth pipe in the Biden's meth pipe. Biden's meth pipe in the building. Me. What's up, brother? Hey, um, I'm the guy who had a Krishan Rock's baby. I changed it. I don't know if you can see it. Okay. Yeah, but I had a question, dude. Um, I've been meaning to ask you this. Um, as far as if black people, uh, FBA in particular, if we were to receive a hate crime bill, would that just be for us or even just all black people, immigrants, all that? It could possibly be for all black people. But, um, you know, we do need a hate crime. We absolutely need a hate crime bill that gives us protections. Um, Sir Willis, just like the Asian hate crime bill, that covered all Asians, I mean, even East Indians, that covered all of them. Sir Willis, what's up, brother? Thank you for having me, brother. Um, I was actually just wanted to chime in on the Diddy thing. Um, it's just interesting because Diddy, he obviously moves the needle globally. Um, you got people from South Africa and Europe and all that talking about him, you know, and I think that's the reason why they they called his number, you know, to 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 put him in this moment because it seemed like every so many years they got to have a prominent Black American male on trial for some sexual deviance. Yeah. Meanwhile, we got um, Vince McMahon who was got all kind of freaky stuff that he was doing with some assistant that he had that he paid that he didn't pay that he was supposed to pay her something, and she got more freakier allegations than what. Supposedly, you know, Cassie and them had. Yeah. So it's just interesting how they 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 pick, they pick up a prominent black male, black American male, and display him out for the for the world to see as the the poster child for sexual deviance, and it's crazy. Mm -hmm. My man, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for the call, sir. Real heavy stuff out here, man. But listen, listen, listen. Um, Y'all go get the movie Microphone Check at microphonecheck.com. Go get that. Go get the book Hidden Heroes from A to Z at hiddenhistorymuseum.com. And get the phenomenal deodorant, Root Work, Root Work deodorant at rootworkstyle.com. Diddy is going to jail. Quite some time ago, I talked about Puff Daddy. I talked about Homeland Security raiding his residence. When I talked about this, I made it clear that when Homeland Security comes after you, there's going to be charges. When we talked about the charges, as of today, he has been arrested, and this is his indictment. A couple of things that are interesting. Once, if you, they got all of his nicknames listed on the indictment. Puff, Sean Combs, Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, Diddy, P. D., and Love. Um... He has charged with racketeering. What is racketeering? The simplest way to describe it is racketeering is like some mob shit. It's literally saying that you have a 
legal organization, but what the government says is your legal organization is doing illegal shit and trying to hide it, and that's what they're saying about Puff Daddy, that you have an organization, <laughs> bad boy, take that, take that, take that, and they're all engaged in doing illegal stuff to promote the overreaching goals of the enterprise, which is you, Diddy. Um, I expect as far as that racketeering count, they're going to be naming a bunch of other people, and all those people will eventually cooperate and snitch on Diddy, Diddy going down. Number two, which I thought was very interesting in talking about the massive indictment, is a couple of things. They talk about the fact um, in this enterprise, they call it freak-offs. They mention freak-offs throughout the point in the indictment. They say, after freak-offs, Combs and the victims typically received IV fluids to recover from physical exertion and drug use. Damn. And then number two in the indictment, which I thought was absolutely interesting, law enforcement seized various freak-off supplies, including narcotics and more than 1,000 bottles of baby oil and lubricant. I don't think they mentioned that shit to be nice. They said, uh, Diddy, you in trouble. Then they also charged him with sex trafficking, which we already talked about, and they also charged him with basically transporting women across county lines to engage in prostitution. So, Diddy's going to jail. We asked what is the difference between federal court prosecution and state court prosecution. Federal court prosecution, what ends up happening, the easiest way I describe it is the feds do the work before they arrest an individual usually. So they build their case. So they have a very large case, a good case against the person that they're going after. They spend a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy going after somebody. State court cases, a lot of time they do the research and the work after they've already arrested somebody. Translation, if somebody comes to somebody and says, that guy hit me, that guy raped me, that guy stole from me, he gets arrested right then and there and then they start looking into it. Federal government, they take their time, energy, and effort. And that's what they're doing against Diddy. Um, Diddy's going to jail. So when somebody asks me, what do I think is likely to happen when the federal government usually comes after you? Your ass is in trouble. And when he comes to a P. Diddy party, this is what happens to the white man. Uh, it's so unfortunate. You gotta pull back, though, so they can see. That's crazy. Come on, move. Matt, move out the way. You're still alive. Look at that. Look at, look. Would you get a drink on his head? And that's, and that's James from Simeon Mobile Disco. He is a actual D DJ. He's not supposed to pass out. But when they come to one of my parties, this is what happens to him. I put him to sleep. Next day, right? Yeah, put the drink on his head. There you go. <laughs> there it is. Damn. I was defending him and he turned around and called witnesses to testify against me and he contributed, he pretty much sent me to prison. So that is the context by which you must always describe that relationship. Yes, I forgave, I moved on, did not do any business. You said he helped fund your political enterprise. I never said that. I said that he proposed to give the Howard Scholarship, which is what I do in all realms. This was not someone uh, who I vacationed with and who he and I enjoyed this great intimate relationship of brotherhood. This is someone who destroyed my life and who I forgave and who I moved on. And for don't distort it as if, you know, he and I were boom ballet. Uh, this is someone that destroyed my life. <laughs> Were you aware of the pre cops? So I, I, I had nothing to do with Sean Combs' uh, personal life, no interaction. That level, everything was strictly on a professional level.